Good morning. I'm John Carney, and I'm pastor of Blue Ridge Baptist Church. And uh, for our regular attenders, members, you notice the background's a little bit different, but uh, our, our fellow church, uh, Mountain View just up the road, and Jonathan, and uh, kindly uh, are assisting in, in recording this service this morning. So if you're recording, it means that you're at home uh, social distancing, and, uh, and so we, we're glad to see you. What we're going to, going to continue to do today is we're going to continue to walk through uh, our way toward Easter and seeking to understand salvation that God has given to us. And we need to understand that our salvation is why Jesus came to earth. Matthew one twenty one says He will save His people from their sins. Why he, salva- Our salvation is why He died on the cross. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for sins once for all. Uh, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And why He rose from the grave. And Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered over to death for our sins, and He was raised to life for our justification. Lauren Cranford is a, a seminary professor I had years ago, and he described salvation this way. <clears throat> salvation is a free gift from God that rescues a believer from sin and its consequences renews a believer to a holy life, and restores a believer to a right relationship with God for all time. He said simply that salvation rescues us from sin. That is justification. And that's what we talked about last week. And that salvation renews us to a holy life. That is sanctification. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And finally, that salvation restores us to a right relationship with God and that takes us home to heaven, and that is glorification. And that's what we'll look at next week. Now, we're going to look at sanctification today. And the title of this message is Highway to Heaven. We're all on a highway somewhere, uh, but uh, many of us are not in a highway we're happy about. And this morning, I want to get you on the right path to have the abundant and satisfying life that God desires for each and every one of you. We're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. We'll glance around at many different verses today, but that'll be a verse we'll return to again and again. Before we read that, <clears throat> I want to share just a word about our current situation. If you're watching us today, it means that you're at home. And uh, I know that uh, this is a tough time and a lot of worries. In fact, I've talked to some folks that have a lot of anxiety. And the question people always ask is, has there ever been a time like this And, of course, the answer is no. Every time is new and different and challenging. But we've had plenty of upheaval in our lives, haven't we? In my own life, I can think of a lot of things. I remember that uh, in my lifetime, two presidents have been shot. One of them was killed. Uh, We've had countless stock market crashes. Uh, Have they been as bad as this one? I, I don't know. But I do remember when my grandmother passed away. They say, look through her house. They kept finding rolled up money hidden in all kinds of places. Why was it there? It was there because she went through the Great Depression where the banks all crashed. And I hope and pray we won't have see anything like that. We see some crazy times. Uh, in these days, you can't find any toilet paper. Now, I don't know if there's ever been a time like that, but I remember when I went to seminary, there was a time where you couldn't find gasoline. In fact, I had to drive 700 miles to seminary And at that point, you could only get $5 worth of gas every time you filled up. It was a crazy time. I remember I lived through the Cold War, where they always said we were one minute from midnight when all the uh, nuclear bombs would fall down. But we were okay, because we could always drop, 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 whatever that word was, and roll, and get under our desks. Now, I'm not minimizing what's going on. Uh, This is scary, and it affects all kinds of people. But I do want to point you to a passage of Scripture. In Psalms chapter 46, verses 1 and 2, it says, God is our refuge and our strength and our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And at the end, in verses 10 and 11 of that same chapter, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Jesus said that no one added a moment to their life by worry. 
but we can trust in God and lean on Him. We will get through this time for two reasons. One is because we live in the greatest nation in the world, founded on biblical principles. God has blessed us with many great leaders, and we'll see through this time as we have many times before. But more than that, we will get through this time because we have a good God who's good all the time. And so during this time, just know that we are here for you. Call me at any time. Text me. I'm praying for you. I want to be there on your behalf. We want you to pray for us. And we need you to be good Samaritans to the people in your neighborhood and and to lift others in prayer. And we need you to keep supporting and giving and sharing because there's going to be a time after this. We're going to crank up VBS, I believe it. And we're going to continue on with the ministry God has called us. Well, this morning we're looking through the highway to heaven. And over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul writes to the folks at Corinth in this, in this way. He says this, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord and, Lord and Jesus Christ, their Lord and, our Lord and ours. This morning I want you to understand two simple things. One, you can be sanctified. And two, if you are sanctified, you need to act like it. Now, what does it mean to be sanctified? I remember uh, years ago, or for many years, I served as a youth minister in several churches. But one, uh, I enjoyed serving for a long time and enjoyed them all. But uh, uh, we were located near a Pentecostal church. And one Sunday, two ladies were looking to go to that Pentecostal church because they were having special meetings. They came from out of town. And somehow they came to our church by mistake. And they weren't sure they were in the right place. And so they wanted to see the pastor. Our services hadn't started yet. So our pastor was glad to talk with him. When one of the ladies saw him, they looked at him and they said, Are you sure you're the pastor? And he said, I sure am, ma'am. And the other lady, without a uh, moment's hesitation, said, Well, you sure don't look sanctified. In a moment's time, they realized they were in the wrong place. And they went out looking for a, what looked like more of a sanctified pastor. Now, what does it mean to be sanctified? What does it mean to look? What does a sanctified person look like? Well, what I want to share with you this morning, first of all, is that you can be sanctified. Well, look again at 1 Corinthians 1 2. Look a little closer. It says, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Now, what does the word sanctified mean? Sanctified is the act or the process of making something holy. In fact, the Greek word for sanctified is the word holy. Now, what does holy mean? Holy is when something is separate. In fact, when you have something that's holy, it's separate from those things that are profane. Now, when you give your life to God, you are choosing to separate yourself for Him and for His purposes. And I was trying to think of a good illustration of that, and the best thing I could come up with is what happens every year at Auburn and Alabama. A bunch of football players go to college, and though there are many thousands of college students there, they are different. Each one of them is set aside for Gus or Nick's purposes. In fact, they are different. In fact, they eat a different diet than the rest of the folks on campus. They have different study habits and study halls. They have different exercise uh, routines. They have different practices. They are there for the purpose of that football program. And when you come to Christ and you give your life to Him and you're sanctified, you are there for God's purpose, different from all the other folks around you. Now, the Bible talks a lot about holy. Over in uh, Psalms chapter 99, verse 9, it says that God is holy. And in Psalms 99, verse 3, it says even His name is holy. And since He is holy, then everyone who has a relationship with Him needs to be holy too. Now, when something is yielded to God's purpose, He can make it holy. In fact, the Bible talks about that God makes time holy. Uh, In fact, he talks about that as the Sabbath. The Sabbath is holy. Uh, Saturday to the Jews as they worship God and Sunday to us Christians today. 
In Genesis 2, 3, it says, but, And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because He rested on that day from all the work of creating that He had done. It is holy. It is a holy day because it is a day set aside to worship God. Places can be made holy. One place that was made holy was Canaan. Over in Exodus 15, verse 13, it says, In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. It was a holy place because it was set aside for God's purposes. People can be holy. Israel was considered holy. Exodus 19, verse 6 says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were set aside for God's purposes. And the folks at the church in Corinth are holy. It says, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. And also you and I can be holy. That verse goes on to say, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've called on the name of the Lord, just like in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've called on him, if you believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Jesus Christ, and you confessed him with your mouth as your Lord and your Savior, Romans 10, 19, 10, 9 says that you are saved. But you're not only saved from sin, you are sanctified. And, and you are on the road to holiness, to a different and a better life. Now, how did this happen? I want to share with you a great verse of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, which talks about what happens to us when we give our lives to God. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Now there's a lot of great words that pop out in the Scripture. When you heard the word and you believed, it says you were marked with a seal. What were you marked with? It says the promised Holy Spirit. And what was it? It was a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. What's all awaiting for you in heaven? But also the promises of God right here and now. And it goes on to say you're God's possession. You belong to Him for His purposes right here and now. If you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you will receive His Holy Spirit and your life will be heading in a new direction. My old Greek professor used to say this, the Holy Spirit actually indwells the sinner at the moment of conversion, and we're all sinners. And a lifelong process of growth in Christ-likeness begins, and that is called sanctification. Well, would you like to get off the path of self-destruction and meaninglessness, of hopelessness? Would you like to begin a new journey to abundance and hope and holiness? You can simply by asking Jesus Christ to be your Savior and your Lord right here and right now. And let's just take a moment. I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of years coming to church and never knowing Jesus as my Savior. And if today you realize that you may know a lot of things about spiritual things, but you've never asked Him to be your Savior and Lord, you can begin that today. In fact, let's just have a, a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, right here and now, if there's anyone listening to this message, and they've realized that they need salvation. They need to call on you and ask you to forgive them and to give them a new life so they can live a better life and get it on a different path that will bring them joy and, and, and live a life that pleases you and honors you. Lord, give them the courage to receive you right here and right now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And if you made that step, then the Bible says you are sanctified. And you know, the Bible says that once you're sanctified, then you know what you need to do? You need to start acting like it. You need to start acting like it. Now, many of you that are listening to me, you've been saved for years, decades, a long time. Maybe you can't even remember when you weren't saved. Well, if you're saved and you're sanctified, you're in the process of becoming Christ-like and you need to act like it. Over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, there's a great passage which reminds us of what we need to do if we're going to live for God. And in this passage, in Philippians chapter, chapter 2, verse 12, it tells us 
to work out our salvation. There we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that you work for your salvation, that you earn it over time and that gets you to heaven? No, you don't do that. What that means is that you, you work on all that God has given you. You seek to transform your life and to become what God wants you to be. You, see, you begin to live out your faith and to live out your new life. And there's two aspects to this working out your salvation. One is that you decide to take action. And we all have to do that, don't we? We have to decide to act. To work out literally means to take something down, uh, to take a decisive action. I was looking in John 14, 15 the other day. Jesus said this. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you really love Jesus, then you will start taking action to be different. And friends, it will take action because we're sinners. We are in need of a savior. And, and we've got to become different from what we were. We've got to become holy, more like God. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, Peter says, But just as he who is holy calls you, so be holy in all that you do. Because God is holy, we seek to be holy. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it tells us that we turn to God and we seek to be holy out of reverence to Him. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Out of love for God, we need to seek to be different. And uh, the Corinthians were sanctified. They were made holy. But if you think about them and you read the book of Corinthians, first and second, you'll find that some of them were involved in some pretty gross sin. How in the world were they holy? You see, what Paul was challenging them to do was in big and small ways to start walking down a different path, to get busy working out their salvation and becoming what God wanted them to be and to move from where they were to where God wanted them to be. And that's a step of faith. I remember at my home church in Albuquerque, a place called Hoffentown Baptist Church, I got to work there as a student. And, uh, and I remember I worked with my pastor, a guy named Dr. Jim, and he was a great fella. And uh, I remember one week, a, a man, a, an adult, uh, got saved at home. And, and he came that following Sunday to declare his faith in Christ. And, he, and during the invitation time, he came forward. Uh, he met with Dr. Jim. Dr. Jim prayed with him. And they sat on the front pew as they were waiting to present him to the church, you know, so that our folks could greet him and, and tell him how thrilled they were of his uh, faith and welcome him into the fellowship. And... Uh, as he sat there in those few moments, he talked to Dr. Jim and he told him, this has been just such a greatest week of my life, just been so great. And in fact, this weekend has been so good. And in fact, he whispered in his ear, you know, this weekend uh, it just has been so good. In fact, this weekend, I only drank three beers. And, and Dr. Jim is so kind. And he looked at him without hesitation. And he said, you know, someday God may lead you to drink no beer. And the fellow paused for a moment and said, you know, I think you're right. You know, he is a sinner. He needed God's grace. And he's got a long way to go in his life. And he needs to be taking action. And in his very small ways, he began to take action. And God was going to lead him to take a whole lot more actions. If we belong to God, then he calls us to work out our salvation. To decisively decide to begin to live for him and to live like him. Now, we need to take decisive action. That's the first thing, to look like we're sanctified and to act like we're sanctified. But secondly, we need to understand that we are not alone. Back in that passage in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said this, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you yet another counselor to be with you forever. The Bible says that when Jesus left, He didn't leave us alone. He sent His Holy Spirit to come live with us. And in chapter that. Verse 18 of that passage in John 14, it says, I will not leave you as orphans. When we come to Christ, we're not left to work this out ourselves. The Holy Spirit comes to stand beside us. 
And I was looking this week over in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 and 8. In verse 7 it says that God has called you a holy life. Called you to a holy life. And that's a tough thing. But it goes on to say in verse 8. Well, he called you to a holy life. But he also gave you the Holy Spirit. To guide you and to help you. And the Holy Spirit is there to guide you. To convict you. To encourage you. To remind you that God loves you. And stands beside you. Now I want to tell you a secret this morning. I am no good at repairing things. Nothing. That's just not a gift God gave to me. But this week. I fixed our washing machine. Now, how did I do that? Well, I got a guy from Wisconsin to come down to my house and help me show me how to open up the the, not the refrigerator, the washing machine, how to look in there and to find the trouble and to fix it. Now, he had to show me three times how to do it, but he was patient and faithful. And after showing me all that, I put it all back together and it worked and I didn't have to buy a new washing machine and save myself a lot of money. Isn't YouTube a great thing? Now, YouTube may be the best thing on the Internet, but I have something in better in life than even a real repairman from Wisconsin. I have the Spirit of God who will never leave me, never forsake me. He never loses patience with me. And as Paul said, with him, I can do all things. And I can, and you can too. Finally, there are a lot of misconceptions about what a sanctified person looks like. Jesus gives us a picture in the story of the Good Samaritan. And as some politicians shed this week or so, you know how it goes. Over in Luke 10, 25 through 37, Jesus tells the story of a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He is robbed, he's beaten, and he's left for dead on the side of the road. And uh, a priest walks by. But he sees him and he walks on the other side. A Levite walks by and he walks by on the other side too. And then a Samaritan shows up. And in most of the stories the Jewish folks would tell back then, they didn't like the Samaritans. It was a good opportunity to boo. That was a bad guy coming up. But in this case, the Samaritan comes by, he sees him, and he has compassion on him. He bandages up his wounds. He put him, puts him on his donkey. He takes him to an inn. And, and, and he gives the innkeeper uh, money to allow him to stay there so that he can heal up and recover. And we looked at who is sanctified in this picture. Most of the time when we look at that picture, we go, the priest is. He's all dressed up in those royals, those robes, ready to go serve in the temple. And he'd be sanctified, but he's not the one. Who would look sanctified? Maybe it's the Levite with all that biblical knowledge. But no, it's not that. It's the Samaritan. The person from the wrong side of the tracks. And why? Because he did what Jesus, God, over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter says, you shall follow in his steps. That's what it means to be sanctified. It means to live for God and to follow in his steps. Our world's in trouble, not just because of this virus, but because it's a sinful world in need of help. It needs the gospel. And you know what it also needs? It needs to see people who are walking on the road to heaven, on the right path, trying to live like Jesus. Now, are you ever going to reach perfection? Uh, No, not this side of heaven. It's not going to happen. But that's not the goal. Your goal is to seek to be like Jesus in every area of your life and to treat everyone like Jesus would treat them. For most folks, That will take a lot of changing. For all of us, it does. You will start doing it today. Let's have a word of prayer. And then after that, I want to share just two brief things with you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you that you love us. And Lord, there's a lot of folks today with anxiety. I ask that you calm that anxiety and help them to trust and feel your presence and to know that you will walk them through. And Lord, for all of us who know you as Lord and Savior, you've called us on a mission. And that mission is to become like you and to treat people in this world as you would treat them. And Lord, help us to be the good Samaritans in our neighborhood and and in all the places where we live. And help us to make a difference for you and your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, two last things. One silly and, and one serious. One is if you come to church with us, you know that every children's church time, I've got to share a riddle for you. 
So here's my riddle for the day. Y'all listening? Okay, what is black and white, black and white, black and white, and black and white? And then usually y'all shout out answers that are always wrong or better than what I have. But the answer is what is black and white, black and white, black and white? It's a panda rolling down the hill. And then usually you gasp and awe and whatever. But anyway, the second thing is uh, we are here for you and I'm here for you. Call me, text me, let me know of needs. Pray for us. I'm praying for you. And seek to be a good Samaritan where you are. God's placed you where you are for a purpose. This will last just a short time. And God wants to do something through you right here and now and bless you. God bless each and every one of you. And I look forward to seeing you soon.